Now, we all think about the meaning of life, sometimes about life in general, what does it all mean, sometimes about our lives in particular. What is my life all about? We try out various concepts and metaphors. Uh, we ask ourselves, is life an adventure? Does it feel like that? Does that seem a good fit? Or is it a series of obligations, just a random collection of events? Is it an abyss that we're falling into? Is it just one damn thing after another and then you die? Is life a mystery? Is it a quest? Right, And so on. Last uh, decade or so, I've spent a lot of time researching entrepreneurship and talking with a lot of entrepreneurs, and I've published a considerable number of formal interviewers with them. One uh, specific question I've had on my mind is, you know, what makes entrepreneurs tick, given that entrepreneurship is a foundational business and economic phenomenon? But there's a bigger question there that, as a philosopher, uh, I've always had in mind when I'm talking with entrepreneurs. Uh, what can entrepreneurs teach us about the meaning of life? And partly the reason for that is that most of us feel the pull, right, of, at least in our business careers, of being an entrepreneur. I have an idea and I usually should, should go ahead and do so. And there are also lots of studies about measured life satisfaction and entrepreneurs typically uh, score surprisingly high on those life measures. So maybe there's something about the phenomenon of entrepreneurship. So what I want to do in this episode is explore entrepreneurship as a, a lens for life. Sometimes we think of entrepreneurs as larger than life characters, you know, like especially the famous ones are like Hollywood stars or, or uh, world famous athletes and so on. But entrepreneurs uh, do seem in many cases to live a larger than uh, life that we're normally consider, right? Because they take big risks, right? They, uh, they make their own rules. They're innovative, they experiment, they often question everything that everybody else takes for granted. And so because of that, it can seem like entrepreneurs are, are a special breed, a breed apart, but I don't think they are. I think all of us are born with the ability to take risks. We're all born with the ability, if it's developed, to think creatively, to, uh, to challenge the every way of doing things. And that's uh, to say, I think we all are born with the entrepreneurial capacity. And the should point or the normative point I want to get in this episode is I think we should and we can tap into those traits uh, at whatever stage of life we are, not only in our careers, but in our lives more broadly, whether we work for ourselves or not. So thinking about life in general and uh, the entrepreneurial way, here's uh, some analogies because I think it's uh, it's primarily a mindset that we that we need to think about. Think about uh, lots of people in their middle years, they're uh, partway through their careers. They're working in a factory job, right? And in some cases, it's uh, it's a factory job that they sort of fell into when they finished high school or or whatever. Or they're working in the, the cubicle farm uh, at some corporation, and they're midlife, and they don't like their work. They often feel like they're they're going through the motions. They have to drag themselves out of the house and go off to work on Monday morning. They say things like, "You know, I'm I'm living for the weekend," and that's uh, kind of a sad state, right? Uh, to, you know, to realize that you know, basically five days out of seven each week. You're not living the way you want to live. You're not who you think you can or should be. You're doing something else. Now, contrast that all with our stereotype of the, the entrepreneur who is out there on the edge. Right? And, and you know, obviously the entrepreneurs fail a lot, but they also succeed a lot. And in spite of this up and down right, success in their entrepreneurial ventures, they feel alive. They feel engaged. Right? They, are, they are committed. They think about their work and, uh, all the time. They enjoy thinking about their work. And even if they, <laughs> things aren't going well, they can't let it go. So there's a level of engagement there uh, that goes with the entrepreneurial life, con contrasted to the way many people seem disengaged and rather zombie-like when they go through a non-entrepreneurial career. Now, another uh, analogy is to think of uh, uh, two types of artists. I've also like to uh, read a lot about artists and spend a lot of time talking with, with artists and have done some stuff in the philosophy of art. And there's a distinction between uh, people who, when they were younger, and thought of themselves as artists and they s decided that they were going to become the best artist that they could be. 
And at a certain point, they decided they weren't going to make it as an artist in that fullest sense. And so they retreated to a kind of second best understanding of what it is to be an artist. So that second best understanding, though, is by contrast to that full, robust artist, you know, the, the sense that when you're dealing with an artist or if you are an artist, you have your own ideas, your own independent vision. You are really engaged with it and you feel that you just need to externalize that in some form, whatever media it is that you are working. And no one can give you that vision and you feel resentful if other people try to tell you what you should be doing in your art and so on. The idea is you're going to do what you do as an artist, make your vision become a reality and it's going to be your vision. You're going to make it the way you think is like. And then of course it's nice and maybe awesome if other people respond to it, but whether other people respond to it or not, that's their issue and that's a secondary matter. But you can't tell me what to do in my art. Now what sometimes happens though is that artists uh, will get to a certain point in their career and realize you know, that they don't have what it takes to be an artist at that level. And in many cases they will talk consciously that they make a decision that they're not going to be artists in that full level and they will become a commission artist. That is to say they will have other people just come to them with commissions and tell them what they like. And you know kind of a standard example would be you just open your studios, you open your your art kit, you're ready to go. Someone comes in and says hey I'd like you to uh, you know paint a portrait of my kids. And here are the clothes that I want the kids to wear. And I want you to paint the background this color. And you know I want it to be this size. And here's when uh, I want it to be delivered. And the person is still an artist, but the person has, in some sense, surrendered the subject, the theme, and in many of the details to someone else. And the person, using a metaphor in my metaphor, has become a hired gun, so to speak. And for many artists who started off with the idea of an independent artist, uh, being an artist in the fullest sense, it feels like a, a failure. Uh, they're still going through the motions and they're still being artists, uh, but in a, in, a, in a lesser sense. Now, another analogy, think of the difference between people who are looking after children, but the way a mother thinks about her child and commits to raising her child, and a daycare worker or a nanny who also exhibits a significant amount of care. The difference is that right, the mother is the creator right, of this new life form. And part of her commitment is to, this was my creation and I want it to become the best that it possibly can be. So she has a sense of ownership right, in her creation. And that's intrinsic to her sense of the meaningfulness of what she does. And by contrast, right, the person who works as a daycare worker or a nanner, you know, of course, you might like kids, but the kids that you're dealing with, you don't think of them primarily as your kids. And in the, the more uh, unfortunate cases, it can devolve into just a job. Because these are someone else's kids, and I'm just doing it for, for pay. So the point of all three examples here is not that the commission artist, the daycare worker, someone who's working for someone else in a factory or a corporation isn't doing valuable work and that they can't get some measure of satisfaction, but their careers are not optimal, right? Or they aren't feeling fully realized right, in what they are doing. That element of I made this, I chose the value, I am the one who initiated and in making it happen. That's the uh, what I'm calling the entrepreneurial element. So of course, it's not that you can't go to work for someone else or you can't accept commissions or you can't be a daycare worker. There is a division of labor society. But the important point here is knowing yourself well and making sure that you are choosing your own core values and making them happen. And if you have a sense that you have that creative potential and you're not living up to it, that's where the problem is. So to generalize this, the, the point is you can't see your life as a commission that is being given to you by other people with an instruction manual that you are to follow. Now, put this a little more formally, there are uh, three elements, right? Life uh, is an act of self-creation. Life as a self-ownership or a self-commitment, right? that sense of ownership, and the, the means issue, that life is a matter of 
self-investment uh, in order to get the outcome. So creation, ownership, and investment. So we can see that in the uh, the highest cases, right? The way mothers feel fully alive. Well, they created, right? This is my child, and they fully invest themselves in the raising of their child. The artist will say, this was my idea, right? my project that I am committing to when I put, say, in the case of painting, the brush to the canvas, and I am the one who made the painting, or the entrepreneur. This was my business idea. I am the one who took charge of it, who initiated it, and I am the one who invested the capital, the sweat equity, and so forth to make it happen. So the idea is that in all of these cases, right, you become the projects that you decide, that you commit to, and that you make happen. Right? And that's the entrepreneurism in the full sense. And it's interesting that outside of the motherhood example, how many times we'll use the, the, the phrase, it's my baby, right? the way a business person will feel about his or her business, or the artist will feel about his or her creation. It's my baby, just like the mother or the father will say, hey, that's my baby, and they feel the same thing to it. That's what we're going for with respect to our lives, right? Your life is your baby, right? <laughs> or you're the baby, but you're also the person who needs to raise your own yourself uh, to, uh, to full realization. Now, the contrast on all three of those elements is uh, people who in their lives, and it might be in their work lives, it might be in their parenting lives, it might be in their artistic lives or whatever, where they feel not fully human. Right? They feel a sense of dehumanization, right? Or like they, they aren't really real as they're going through the motions of whatever they're doing. Or we talk about uh, feeling like a zombie, right, on the job. And what seems to be there is uh, you did not make the enterprise, right, that, uh, that you are, you're working in, right? Somebody else made the enterprise. Someone else has formulated the strategy. Someone else has created the job function, say. And you are just kind of fitting into that slot. In some cases, it's uh, that you didn't really commit to that position. It was more, you say, here was a job that came along and you kind of fell into it because, you know, hey, you don't feel like there's other options available to you or you're not really interested in checking in, uh, checking them out. And you didn't really make it happen, right? Uh, if you're that kind of person who requires the oversight, right? You will, you will do the work that you need to do, but in the back of your mind, you're doing it in part because other people are checking up on you. And if you don't get it done, then there will be negative consequences and so on. Or another analogy, uh, you feel about your life, right? That you are like an actor, right? Playing a role, right? Someone else wrote the script and your job is to fit into that role and perform the words and actions as directed. And again, the point here is not that you can't be an actor, right? As your career, right? But you can't see yourself as an actor in your life, that your life is somehow someone else's script and you've been assigned a particular role and certain words to say. Now, the word for all of this is entrepreneurism, and that's meant to be a generalization on the phenomenon of being an entrepreneur. Now, what does that mean uh, more specifically? Here, we need to think about our lives in all of their aspects, because uh, there are you know, many uh, elements that we're, we're all juggling many balls at the, at the same time. But in any area of our life, it is easy to get stuck in a rut, right? And unless we continue to think somewhat creatively and take some risks in that area of life. And we can't, you know, say be constantly juggling 20 balls. Some parts of our lives we might have on more or less automatic pilot while we're working on other areas. But every area of life, we need to cycle through it and with some imagination and some energy continue to work on it entrepreneurially. So we all know from our family lives how they can be confining, they can be limiting if we're not approaching it, you know, that each person has their own life to live and what we're trying to do entrepreneurially is uh, commit to each person's uh, individual development. And the same thing can happen in our leisure activities, whatever artistic uh, things we're interested in, sports, travels, we just watch the same old shows or watch the same old games, or maybe we always go to vacation in the same way or at the same place at the same time. And it can't be, it's not the case, you know, that there can't be genuine enjoyments there, but they can become mechanical and routine if we're not thinking about them entrepreneurial.
entrepreneurially. And we know in all of these areas, sports, travel, and the arts, we can experiment, we can try new things. And uh, when we do that thing, and just the fact that we're trying new things brings renewed zest to it. In one way, you know, none of this is rocket science or unexplored territory, because we all know, I think at some level, that it's good to try new things, to look at the world from a fresh perspective. But we do know that we often don't live that way, that it is easy to fall into the routines. Uh, it does take effort to self-reflect. It does take effort after that self-reflection to uh, initiate something. Uh, and it's often important to remind ourselves that it's worth doing that, uh, but we need more specifics in, in many cases about how to, to do so. For me, I've found that spending time around kids, uh, this can be university kids, high school kids, and, uh, and younger, it's, uh, it's refreshing because they remind us uh, that all of this kind of came naturally to us when, when we are, are younger. A phenomenon I've seen several different times uh, involving, say, three-year-olds or four-year-olds or whatever. The kid is uh, struggling with some project or other, not doing it very well. There's a lot of failure there. And then a well-meaning older person, an adult, tries to, uh, to help the, the, the three-year-old or the four-year-old. But the three-year-old rejects the help and will say something like, I do it, right? And here the idea is that the three-year-old owns the project and is absorbed in it. And his or her, really, the satisfaction turns on his or her overcoming that challenges independently. And that's a basic entrepreneurial commitment. This is my project. I'm committed to it. I'm going to make it happen. And the person is then resisting, right, falling into letting someone else take over and just solve the problem for it. And of course, we know by adulthood, life becomes really complicated. Sometimes we're stuck with the challenges. We all know there are the jobs that contain grind elements that we're not uh, engaged with. Uh, and that can happen in, in any area of life. And this is where I think the, the entrepreneurial element becomes essential. Right, to get ourselves regularly to say why right, about any aspect of our lives. Now, I think partly this is why you know, birthdays, weddings, funerals, New Year's, and so forth are moments where we engage in these self-reflective moments. And that's important about those. But we should schedule them for ourselves more frequently so that we can imagine the alternatives, experiment, and commit to finding a better new way. And whether we're a kid, right, or whether we're an adult who's working on this uh, self-development, I think it's the same entrepreneurial elements that are there. Going back to the difference between starting a business and working for someone else, right? The startup business entrepreneur feels this ownership of the business, feels responsible for defining its purpose, feels uh, uh, that making the strategy is part of who he or she is. And there's a difference, right? If you're an employee and you come into that pre-existing business and you follow along. And again, working for someone else might be a perfectly good career option for me. Being an employee with respect to my own life, that is not a legitimate option. My, my life is my project. It's up to me to initiate it, to maintain it. I can't simply just follow someone else's script. Again, I like uh, kids on this point here. I think intuitively they grasp this point when uh, you know, they get into some conflict with their parents or an older sibling, and they will say, you're not the boss of me. Right? Now, whether the kid is right or wrong in the particular circumstances, notice that the kids who say that sort of thing, they're asserting that basic entrepreneurial attitude in their life, right? No one is the boss of me, right? And so the kid says, you know, this is my life and they're in charge of it or they're aspiring to be as in charge of it as they possibly can given their degree of development. So if there's a well-meaning authority, right, a parent, a teacher, an older sibling who's overstepping, then the kid quite rightly will be on the receiving end of that kid's assertive pushback. And so the important thing is, as adults, is never to lose that, right? That sense of, I am the boss of me. Uh, so we need to remind ourselves sometimes that we are, in fact, our own bosses. Now, more generally, uh, there is, and this is a connection I want to make to some of the scholarly literature on entrepreneurship that I've, I've looked at and uh, hopefully contributed to. The elements here are autonomy, Right. The idea of self-chosen goals, 
and then self-initiation toward those goals. That's at the beginning of the process. During the process, the sense of ownership and commitment to the process in an ongoing fashion. And then always with an eye to the end of the process when hopefully successfully you will reap the rewards. Partly those are going to be the material or financial rewards of of whatever the project is, but also that psychological reward, the the pride that I did this, I accomplished this, and the enhanced self-esteem that comes with it. And the point is that all of those things can't be given to you. The goals can't be given to you. The initiative can't be given to you. The pride of successful creation cannot be given to. Those all have to be earned. There's a what question and a how question, right? And this is, again, to speak more philosophically and broadly here, what is your life about? What are those core values and goals go to be? Part of the entrepreneurial outlook on life is committing to defining those for oneself. And then the means question, how am I going to go about achieving them? Now on this how question, there's another element I want to uh, tease out more about this entrepreneurism. That's about rules, how we think about rules. And kind of our attitude toward rules is a closely related aspect of kind of the entrepreneurial mindset. If we go back to uh, entrepreneurs in practice, right, one of the things that does seem to be an important feature about them is that they are the ones who make the rules, and often they are rule breakers. Uh, in order to be innovative and creative, they are willing to break pre-existing rules and to find other rules or new rules that will will be better suited here. Games and kids playing games, it seems like I'm always going back to kids here today, but uh, it's a really good metaphor for life here. I think we think about games, uh, particularly since games really are constituted by their rules. Kids, so suppose you're, you've are you got some kids and they're learning how to play basketball or whatever the sport is. Well, basketball is constituted by a particular set of rules that differentiate it from soccer, that differentiate it from tennis, and so forth. So the kids learn that basketball has specific rules, things that you can do and things that you can't do. But then take the kids who've got the basic idea about what basketball is and put them on a playground, take away the supervision. And what happens is those kids become endlessly inventive in making up and modifying the rules. They'll start playing two-on-two. They'll start playing horse. They'll argue about the three-point line and whether it should be this distance or that distance or not there at all, and so on. Every rule gets subjected to, experimented with, and sometimes (laughs) the, the rules just get broken and set aside, and they are on their way to making up their own game, uh, some variation on basketball, and it might even evolve into a completely different game. All right, the rules aren't set in stool. Rules are there to help us achieve our purposes rather than our job is to fit solely into pre-existing rules and just follow them because that's what the rules are. Another example here, if we think about when we are writers, especially when we're young writers and our teachers are, are, are showing us, you know, so they might say, for this uh, essay, every paragraph has to have five sentences in it. And when you're writing this paper, you need to have 10 references, and here are the acceptable range of sources and so on. But as we grow as writers, right, we come to understand that rules like that really are very targeted. They have very limited purposes, and often they are breakable. And as mature writers, we really only select those rules that are going to help us achieve our purposes, and we ignore the rest of the rules, and we will make new rules for ourselves. And the excellent writers, uh, the writers that are innovative, seem to be the ones who are most willing to be entrepreneurial with the rules of writing and to make their own rules for their particular content and, and style. And it's the exact same principle then if we generalize to the game of life. If you are the writer of your own life or you're, you're making up the game of your own life, it's important that we are cultivating our own ability to think about the basic rules and assumptions, right? Which rules can be changed in my life? Which ones can be broken? Which ones should be broken? And so what we can all do is, uh, as practical exercises, you know, whatever games we play, maybe we play basketball or tennis, do that personal experiment. Say, I'm going to change this particular rule in this game or sport that I play. Just change one rule and play the game and see what happens. Another thing about rules 
and uh, children when they're playing games is that they tend to be deciders right, rather than permission askers. When you watch children at play, they're doing their own thing, their own way. And this is really what absorbs them and helps them learn perseverance. Right? Entrepreneurs, it's the same thing. They are making their own judgments and they are acting on the basis of them. They know there will, they will make bad judgments. They know that they're going to fail. Those are always risks. But the rule of thumb for both children and entrepreneurs seems to be go ahead and do it and then, if necessary, ask forgiveness and fix the mess up afterwards. So, again, a lot of this is not rocket science or, or mystery, but it's worth dwelling on and reflecting on what holds so many of us back right, from maintaining that basic entrepreneurial way of being. If we all start off that way as children, of course, one thing that happens is that children are damaged by bad parenting and bad teaching, and they might lose these uh, these capacities. But I think there are, are other traits, even if we had had a good, healthy education and a good, healthy upbringing. You know, one of the cliches that I think is true is that change is harder as we get older. Uh, inflexibility does come with age, not just you know, the creaking joints and the stiff muscles, but there are psychological correlates to those. And one of the things that brings inflexibility is fear, right? So sometimes I think this entrepreneurial set that we all somewhat aspire to in our lives can be blocked because of the fears that we have. And uh, we know that it's going to take commitment. It's going to take energy. It's, you know, we know it's going to make us tired. And so it always takes energy, which is a cost, to do something for yourself and not just to kind of go with the flow that other people are dictate or whatever the current surroundings are. Yet at the same time, we all know that our important commitments, right, our friendships, right, our marriages, our being good parents, they take investment and constant ongoing investment. We only are going to get out of them what we put into them. And of course, there's no guarantee that the investment will pay off, but that spark of entrepreneurial risk-taking in our, all of our significant relationships and the willingness to do so has to be there, and it has to be mutual for those relationships to, uh, to work. Sometimes there's another kind of fear that can uh, cause us to become more rigid and in inactive, and that's a kind of failure, fear of uh, failure or a fear of, of disapproval. We don't want to think of ourselves as failure. We don't want to think of ourselves through other people's eyes and have to put up with their disapproval. That's another social cost. At the same time, while that fear is, I think, a part of part of life, we know on the other side, if we just go the completely safe route, we go the completely indecisive route, we don't take any failure risks and we don't do anything to offend anybody or that might offend anybody, those are just going to turn us into automata. Right? At the same time, we also know that everybody wants to be with people who are really into whatever it is that they do and stand for something, and we know who that person really is. So the failure, the disapproval, that is part of the process, but we need to overcome that by recognizing that those are just, uh, that can just set you up for uh, a rigidity that will make it impossible for you to achieve your values. Another time uh, issue as we get older is uh, sometimes uh, this feeling that it's too late to change, right? Maybe I could have become a great entrepreneur or an artist when I was in my 20s or even my 30s or whatever, but now I'm in my middle years. Uh, I'm 40, 50 or whatever. And here I think there are some uh, important counterexamples. Many artists right, remain vital and improve on through the later years of their lives. Many people start parenting later or have second relationships, huge romantic relationships later in life that rekindle their experience. So it's never too late for any of those things. In the business world, Ray Kroc and McDonald's, I like to point out to my students that uh, chances are very good they're not going to be doing one job for the rest of their lives, and at some point they're going to be 50 and wondering uh, if it's time to make a major career change. Ray Kroc right, was in his 50s when he came across McDonald's and said, McDonald's on its uh, expansive trajectory. The uh, psychologist Abraham Maslow was almost 60 years old when he had a heart attack and then wrote movingly about what he came to call the post 
post-mortem life, how he suddenly realized, and this is a very perceptive psychologist talking about you know, engagement and uh, the hierarchy of needs and so forth, but realizing how free he was really to pursue what truly mattered in his life. And the idea seemed to be he had noticed other men of about his age who had had heart attacks and almost died, but had survived. You know, they came to realize how locked in they felt by their, uh, you know, their mortgage commitments or the jobs and uh, in the sense that their life was pretty much over. So maybe it's not worth changing up things very much. But the heart attack made them become philosophical and very reflective. And they came to realize that every additional day they got was a gift, right? And that was the language that they used. And what, what really did they have to lose if they screwed up that day or the next month or the next year? And so they were more willing to try to do all of the things that they really wanted to do, but had felt constrained by their middle-agedness not to be doing before they had had the heart attack. Now, none of this, I think, uh, means that you have to turn your life entirely upside down. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to stop doing all of your traditional ways of doing things that you enjoy or important things and coming up with everything. It doesn't necessarily mean starting your entire life over. Maybe that's not even possible, but it can mean making small experiments. Maybe that's the best way to start. Take some everyday routines, take little things that we think are set in stone and change them right, with a little experimentation. And those little experiments will add up to a stronger sense that we really feel like we own our own lives. So some examples of some little things. Uh, you know, take a risk every day, something small. You know, go to a new restaurant, right? one that you've never eaten at before. Yeah, the meals might be crappy. It might not be like, but at least you're doing something new. Try something on the menu that you've never eaten before, something that looks a little weird to you. And of course, you might like it, you might not like it, but you're doing the experimenting. Take a dancing lesson, right? take a drawing lesson, take a kayaking lesson, change up your, your uh, fashion sense, you know, wear some bright yellow pants, right? wear a slightly daring shirt or a, or a strange hat. But the point just is do something different you know, every day, every week, and then make it a habit to do something different every day, every week. Another method, get more entrepreneurial people in your life and seek out people who have done some unusual things with their lives, people who've traveled a lot, people who have unusual or very different musical tastes. Uh, hang out with people who are the active ones at parties who like to play charades and can laugh at themselves right when they uh, you know when they do experiments that don't work out right very well again going back to children since they often have fresh and in some cases offbeat ways of looking at the world they're always coming up with questions right why 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 uh, and in many cases their questions are are a little bit weird but they will lead you to you know, think about things that you haven't necessarily thought about and to try to come up with a fresh way of looking at the world in order to answer these questions that are coming from children who are just starting off on their own new path. Of course, we know family life for many of us is very important, and family life can also be a source of great uh, boredom. It can also be a source of feeling in a rut and great frustration, but there are lots of techniques to overcome that. Try a new board game. Uh, might be a little old-fashioned on that. Kids these days might say, oh, board games, what are those? Okay, so then they're playing the video games. Well, find a multiplayer video game that your kids are interested in and try it with them. Right? Uh, instead of just, say, the mom or the grandma making the entire holiday meal, all of the family uh, responsible for a different dish and contributing to the, to the family, the holiday meal. Right? It's a, that's an experiment. And who knows, of course, uh, whether you'll like all of those dishes or not. Listen to your children's music. If you have a spouse or significant other, any new idea your spouse suggests, just more or less automatically say, yes, let's do that. Other leisure options. We know travel can be expensive, but most of us are uh, often, we all kind of know that there are lots of things that uh, in our area tourists come to see, but we've never quite gotten around to doing ourselves. So be a tourist in your own town. Uh, find a new thing to do each month. And of course, the online world is opening up huge numbers of options. There are lots of schools and organizations that are offering short courses, long courses that you can take just for fun in electronics, Greek history, bird watching, taekwondo, whatever it is. And on top of that, 
as one kind of overarching principle, break at least one rule every day. Thank you.